Hey guys, what's up? Uh, it's Tuesday. I'm excited about today. Um, so, hey, before we get started, um, say hello. Hey, Mark. Hey, Danny. Uh, say hello in the uh, in the live comment section so I can see uh, that you're here. Uh, I, I can see a number at the top that tells me how many people are watching, but I don't know who that is unless you say something in the comments. So uh, I would just appreciate knowing that you're here. And also tell me where you're from. Okay, I know Mark's from uh, uh, California. Danny, where are you where are you calling in from, or where are you where are you watching from, Danny? Uh, anyway, hey, I'm uh, really excited about uh, talking to Brent today. Brent is, uh, if you uh, some of you guys remember from the Mixed Coach Experience Weekend 2017, um, Brent was the was the dude there. We did a one one man uh, band kind of thing. Uh, Brent, sorry, I'm seeing Danny Miller, Brent, don't be offended. I, I keep trying to say Danny. I know Danny's your brother, but, uh, I'm seeing Danny here and talking to you, but, uh, Brent plays a ton of instruments and he's also uh, a great singer. He is a great producer and I am going to wear him out with questions. And I hope you guys, um, will chime in and ask questions too, because Brent is just a wealth of knowledge. Before we go to Brent, though, I want to tell you about something I have been working diligently on, okay? It's a brand new training that I'm working on um, or that I am doing, and it's going to debunk some myths about mixing. Um, and I have to tell you, number two is the second myth that I'm going to debunk is kind of controversial, and it's something that... Uh, it could be a career ender for some people unless you know how to navigate this. So check it out. I'm not just saying that to hype it. I really think that this is going to be helpful for a lot of people. Hey, Larry. Um, so go to, let me put it up here for you so you can find it easily. It's, uh, if you go to mixcoach.com forward slash myths, it is a training series. And uh, if you sign up for that, you'll get the first, um, the first video today. All right. So, uh, mixcoach.com forward slash myths. I, I know that you're going to be encouraged by it. Uh, I was encouraged by it and I did it. So I was like, yeah, I'm glad I said that. No. So anyway, uh, okay. So without much hesitation here, I'm so excited to talk to Brent. Let's go ahead and bring him on. Brent, how you doing? Hey, everybody. <laughs> How's Brent, it going? It looks like we are uh, we're studio twins. I know it. We're, we might be in rooms beside each other and people wouldn't even know well, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we could be, you've got a few we more are across town from each other. Yeah, we are. I, I've driven over to, um, Mount Juliet several times, um, working some background vocals over there. And, uh, it's about what, 45 minutes from here. Seems yeah, like right. Nashville's kind of sp spreading out and, uh, Ooh. It, it is a drive across town can be an hour, right? Easily. For sure. Okay. Easily. So Brent, I have been coming up with a list of questions, not just for people in the, who are watching, but for me, I'm uh, selfishly wanting to know some of this stuff too. Sure. So, but before we get started, why don't you, um, why don't you kind of give me like a, just a couple minutes synopsis of uh, about your history? Cause you've got a really cool uh, family history and, yeah. uh, and tell me how you got, from a young one-year-old musician to where you are now in about five minutes. Can you do that? Yeah, sheer luck. <laughs> <laughs> End of story. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we grew up, uh, my family had a music theater in Panama City, Florida, growing up. Uh, that was a, like the Branson style show, if you're familiar with that. It's a variety show that had our whole family involved. There were three generations of us. My granddad started it. And I was the first of my generation. So when I came along, uh, it, it was like the Lion King moment where they bring Simba out on the mountain and hold him up. And they were just so proud of here's this this new generation that has started of what we do. So I was on stage at a very early age, uh, probably two or three years old. They were bringing me out to play the drums and, and learn. I don't really remember learning how to play the drums. If that, <laughs> wow. if that works with anybody, I was learning that when I was learning to walk. So which I'm grateful for. That was cool. So there were always instruments around, always opportunities to be on stage and play. Um, and we didn't shy away from it too much. Um, I, I figured out at an early age, I didn't really want to be the guy out front. 
I really enjoyed being a drummer and being a keyboard player and being a bass player, just being on that back line and a part of the band. But man, I did not want to be the guy out there, you know, shaking it and going and getting the crowd going. That was not my thing. Right. So we had a recording studio there as well that I, I got into it in my teens and learned how to start running all that stuff. Um, there were several studios in the area down there in North Florida where we were that uh, started hiring me uh, and my brother, both Danny, that you mentioned earlier. Um, we both got into that around the same time and started learning that process back on ADATs and, and all that mm -hmm. stuff when it was the thing at the time. So along the way during that whole process, we end up meeting um, a guy uh, out of Nashville named Billy Dean, if anybody remembers him, a country artist from the 90s. And he was putting together a new band at the time and uh, asked us both if we wanted to be a part of that. And I was, I didn't really think he was serious because I knew enough about how this town works that I figured he's going to go back to Nashville and his management's going to say, no, you're not hiring these kids from Florida to be in your band. You know, stop being an artist. How you know, old were you at this time? I was 23, 24. This was, yeah, right, right around that time. And, um, and sure enough, a couple months later, we get a call from his management saying, Hey, if you guys are interested, you know, Billy wants you in the band. And so let's give it a shot. And we did. And uh, that got the ball rolling at that point. You know, you can if you move to town with a gig, that's a huge blessing in fortune mm -hmm. because you're already in a position to be networking with guys that have done it longer than you that, that can refer you to some other things. Um, you know, it, it still wasn't quick off the line for me at that point. It still took some time to kind of find my footing, um, but it, it definitely got the ball rolling and it was very fortunate. Yeah. Well, yeah. so. Uh, we we touched on this just a little bit. I'm, I'm just going to uh, jump right to it. You mentioned something. Um, <clears throat> so the thing in Nashville lately and music business in general is that people are kind of like morphing into other things. You've got, you know, you've got yeah. musicians who are now mixing engineers. You've got um, session guys who are now road guys or you know, not this past year, but now you've got road right. guys that are session guys. You've got uh, publishing companies that are, you know, doing different things. You've got record companies that are becoming, as you mentioned, um, management companies. Mm -hmm. So I would love to know from somebody who tends to stay as busy as you are right now, if you could, what is it? What is a trend that you see? What is a skill that um, me, you, these guys that are watching, um, what is a skill set that they could learn in the next, I don't know, five years is really going to, you feel like carry. Uh, I'll, I'll answer forward. on a couple of different levels because I think number one, the one thing I recommend people study a lot in this business that never gets talked about is psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the relationship side of, of people, because ultimately, no matter what shifts happen and no matter what mutations happen with all of this, if you have relationships and you're good at client management and you're good at all of that, mm -hmm. you're going to keep finding success somewhere because it's just going to kind of take you down that path. You know, um, if people liked you in the studio and you got along good with the artists that you worked with, they'll mm -hmm. call you and say, I'd love to have that guy in my road band. I wonder what right. he's doing. You know, you can always say no. But, but keep saying yes, you know, that's that's kind of the skill. Just keep acting like you're interested mm -hmm. in everything and, and the right stuff's going to find your way. As far as more technical skills, that's a tough one, man, because it, it seems to change week to week. I, really, just any skill, because I don't know that you can be skilled enough right now. The fact that I've got quite a few different tools in my belt that I can rely on at any given time keeps my calendar full. But if I relied on any one of those and said, this is all that I am, I'd be starving right now, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I do believe in, in expertise still. And I think that, that we do need to depend on people who are great at what they do and not try to do everything ourselves, mm -hmm. but, but always be learning and, and be able to differentiate the projects where maybe this is one I can take a chance on to mix this one myself. But if a big one comes through that your name's going to be attached to and you don't feel 110 percent confident in mixing it, hire a mix engineer. Mm -hmm. He'll do it and spend time with him and learn what he's doing 
build a relationship there because he's going to think, well, you played great on this record. I, I got somebody who's looking for a guitar player right now and he'll refer stuff your way, you know, but there, there's a healthy balance in both of those. Yeah, I, th- I find that it, there's it's such a it's such a two edged sword of being somebody that has a lot. Of, you can do just about anything, and and I I f- I feel like I have a, a kind of a wide range of things that I can do. But here's the downside of that is the social the social right. aspect of it because you know um, not to wax spiritual here, but you know. I feel like God's blessings and the the way that we are advanced in life um, usually doesn't happen on a solo trip. Doesn't happen when you're by yourself. It happens 100%. when you're with people. So, yeah. one of the things I have a good friend who who you know had a home studio, a nice home studio, and he ended up moving downtown, and now he is part of some really cool projects. Um, mm-hmm such a two edged sword of, you know, being able to do several things and, and balancing that whole human psychology thing with, uh, and, and hanging out with people over efficiency. Uh, you know, it feels like, it feels like, I mean, you know, it can, in my position, I've always been able to offer people probably a little better deal than what everybody else can around town because I'm the only one working on it. My, my cost is a lot more manageable, Mm -hmm. you know, um, so there are advantages to that. Um, but yeah, you do have to find that balance. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is, uh, your band, your guitar player can talk to your bass player and get him <laughs> to play for free. <laughs> That's the deal. Yeah. 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 So, so curious, what is your, um, uh, and it sounds like you were pretty busy during the whole pandemic thing. What was your, uh, and, and, and you're, you're doing different things, but what was your 80, 20 or you're familiar with 80, 20 principle. What yep. was your 80% of what you did? Uh, just production work really to, to sum it up into a a thing, you know, it's hard to, it's a lot of different pieces, but it was mostly, I'll, let me go back a couple of years first. Um, I toured for about 15 years on the road and, uh, about this time, two years ago, I just started feeling that itch of, I knew I, I wasn't supposed to be out there anymore. And, um, it, it's weird. It just flipped like a switch in my head of every time going to meet the bus. It was such a drag to get myself there. Couldn't wait to get back. Um, I think I was probably grumpy and irritable and the guys out there would, would reiterate that, you know, <laughs> but I, for whatever reason it clicked and I recognized that in myself and said, it is time to make a move. And so I spent that last little bit sort of preparing, um, expecting there to be a little bit of a financial hit when it happened, you know, but knowing that this was going to be right. You know, I started looking at the number of days it was taking to be gone. And if I had those days back in town, could I turn that into the same amount of money? Mm -hmm. And I I got to figuring, even if it was close, Mm -hmm. just getting to sleep in my bed every night and be home and be more in control of my day-to-day life was there's value in that. Mm -hmm. So that was going to be worth whatever it would cost me. Um, and as soon as I got off the road within a month, I got a call, uh, with a referral to pick up uh, an account doing, um, karaoke tracks. And so that kept me very busy through all Mm -hmm. that time. They were, they were sending me, uh, 12 new tracks about as quick as I could get them done. You know, Mm -hmm. that that turned into about a five to six week cycle to be able to crank that out. Of course, Mm -hmm. that's me playing just about everything on them. I'd, I'd farm out steel and fiddle and some of the things that I don't do, um, and I found great players that could work remotely to where I didn't have to bring anybody over here. We could be double timing on everything. So that, that was a standing account there for a while, um, uh, which kind of filled the gaps in. And then, uh, you know, flash forward about seven or eight months, and then the whole world kind of stopped turning for everybody. But I had already gotten a lot of stuff in place. that mm-hmm. came through. So that was a big chunk of it. Um, another thing was my church. Um, I, I was... Uh, one of the few that was okay with going in and playing live for our live stream stuff and, and uh, during all the shutdown business. And um, they, they had me mix a song. I can't remember exactly the, the timing of it, but it was something we had cut live uh, on the platform. And they said, take stab at it, see what you can do with it. And when I turned it in, they were just, you know, head over heels about it and loved it and thought that was, that it sounded great. Um, I said, 
if could you do that with our services every week? You know, if we taped early and got you the, the audio and then you turn this back into video, I said, sure, you know, let's go for it. So that turned into a, a regular weekly gig as mm-hmm. well, uh, kind of a part time thing. So it was just several pieces that all kind of came together. And like I say, keep saying yes to everything and, and something's mm-hmm. going to come through most of the time. So I read a book. Um I forget, I forget who wrote it uh, and I won't try to remember, but it was the premise of the book was saying yes to everything. Mm-hmm. I think it's called the year of yes. Okay. Where, um, where she, she, she's an, she's a writer and, and she was saying that she was a I read about that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she, she writes uh, Grey's Anatomy. And yeah. now she's, I mean, she, anyway, but she wrote a book about uh, saying yes to everything and how much opportunity, uh, and things that she wasn't expecting, uh, how much it brought her. But then you talk to productivity experts and they say to say no to everything except for what you're good at. But, and, and I'm I, I would recommend, that. if I was going to recommend two books at one time, I'd say read the year of yes and read one called boundaries that I read last year. Yeah. Um, because if you can find the balance of that, yeah, I think it's healthy to say yes to everything and have an open mind and be ready for whatever, but you do have to understand how far is too far? Mm-hmm. As long as you know that, then within oh. the bubble, say yes to everything. You know. Yeah. So, so uh, going back to your church thing, I'm very familiar uh, as of yeah. late with you know church right. work and stuff like that. So you were doing, uh, you guys were doing recording, say on Wednesday, and you right. were embellishing and kind of overdubbing, fixing, mixing. A little right? bit. We. Uh, we don't use any backing tracks at our church where a lot of them do now. Um, all we do is just play to a click track. Our drummer generates one and everything else goes down live as we go. And this was a, a learning process for me because I had never mixed a live, um, a live broadcast like that, you know, on a, a standing basis, regular thing, especially that was going to be aired on, on a screen. Mm-hmm. I've mixed live records that were done for audio only. Um, but never for um, something that was going to be broadcast. Mm-hmm. And so the first few weeks when I would do it, I, I mixed it like I would mix a record, you know, and tried to get everything sounding right. And then I would watch it back and think, boy, that really doesn't look realistic anymore. Mm-hmm. You know? And I had to start thinking a lot more in terms of how is this going to look as well as sound. Mm-hmm. You know? I would try to fix vocal levels and stuff and not be thinking about the fact that maybe that singer yeah. actually backed way out of their mic. Yeah. And yeah. if they stay really loud when they do that, it doesn't translate, you know, so mm-hmm. you gotta let it go soft. You know, mm-hmm. another thing was when you're mixing records, one of the number one comp- or complaints you get is turn the vocal up. I can't hear what mm-hmm. they're saying. You know, yeah. with the worship service, they're printing the words on the bottom of the screen and psychologically, people know what you're saying. So Mm -hmm. you're not going to have to worry as much about throwing that vocal way out in front. So that was, you know, yeah. Um, In my, my supplementing, I don't do a whole lot. I really tried to intentionally mix what was there and make it sound as good as it can without having to add too much. Because again, I'm, I'm a stickler for, you don't want to see no electric guitar player on stage, but you're hearing all these electrics. Yeah. Yeah. Vice versa. Like if if we have an acoustic player there that day and something is just really lacking and needs a little extra, you can add a second acoustic and no mm-hmm. one's going to notice that it sneaks mm-hmm. in there. Uh, but if there's not something present on stage doing what you're hearing, then to me, that's a problem. You know, it needs to represent what you're you're viewing. Same thing with drum sounds. You know, we all want to pan them up and get them big and space stuff out. But when you're watching on the screen, the drums are right there in the middle of the screen. You know, so you don't want to hear a tom hitting over here and then a cymbal over there and all this stuff like we we want on records. So that shift was a, a learning process for me, but um, we've got it dialed in now. We've been doing it a year at this point, and uh, it's become a real thing for our church. They actually um, ended up shifting a couple of our pastors to be online pastors, and they're just pastoring that community now, mm-hmm. reaching a lot of people that don't even live here locally. Yeah. Are you doing the online thing in addition to live? Are you, are you back? Yes, we're doing both now. Um, we, the, we tape the same service that we do on Sunday morning. Um, and we do the whole thing with what they call live to tape. You know, we just tape a live service on a Wednesday night. The preacher of that week comes in and 
preaches their sermon, and then um, we just run that live. So it takes mm-hmm. about an hour to, to run down. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty easy yeah. night. I spend the whole next day, I put a full day of post into it, you know, getting it right. Um, and then turn that in and video gets it and syncs it all up and does their thing. Yeah. That's cool. So, uh, I, so when you're um, not busy doing music, I, well, here's a question for you. If you, um, if you were, if music was not a thing, if you, how, what, what career would you, would you have, have chosen if, if you weren't mufasa into, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, for a long time, I thought that answer was law. I love a good yeah. debate and I love thinking things through the way those guys do. Um, I don't know how happy I would have been doing that. It's hard to say. Um, I like marketing a lot. I think I, I could have gone down that path mm-hmm. and enjoyed, enjoyed that. Um, but that that's about the only things that really have, have struck out at me mm-hmm. as far as that goes. I like a good challenge, but I, the people side of this, it's ironic as much as I work by myself mm-hmm. you know, with just me. I really do like the people side of this mm-hmm. business and the relationships and the friendships that come with it. So, yeah. you know, something that would still afford that would be something I would have chosen. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in here. Uh, sure. You want to you take a take a exit here? and, and uh, Fire away. So we've got people from... Sao Paulo, Brazil. We got people from Indiana. Um, oh, man, those are about the and same. I think you may be, be familiar with that. Andreas, uh, he said. Yeah. Uh, oh, hey, Andreas. <laughs> excellent work as usual on your latest. Yeah, project. we've done some great work together. Yeah. So you went to uh, uh, Sweden or? <laughs> yeah, it was a quick little trip. <laughs> yeah. That's a great case, man, for we can work anywhere now. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. I, we get people from all over the world. Yep. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, I lost my place here. Um, Gregory Price wants to know, are you developing any new artists right now? You know, I don't really do a whole lot of development. Um, I spend so much time doing the creation part of the work that I really don't have the right relationships to then take them somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um it's it's a shifting landscape right now, and, and any of the people that I know that probably are the right people or that could do that, let me say, are mm-hmm. not the right people anymore. Yeah. Um, because I mean, it's it's amazing how much has shifted in this town in Nashville in the last fifteen years. Mm-hmm. You know, um, when I got here, American Idol was just starting. You know, and mm-hmm. so it's crazy that that that's almost an afterthought now. We're about past that. Mm-hmm. At this and so the people that are calling the shots and doing everything, they have a lot younger mindset than I do on most things. I'm still pretty old school. And, uh, you know, I, I still believe handshakes and someone who actually buys a track <laughs> makes a difference. But mm-hmm. You're not yeah. going to convince them. Yeah. Um, we talked about this uh, before we went live. Are you writing? Are you still writing a lot? Have you have you been a writer? Do you? I, I kind of stumbled backwards into writing. Um, I never made it a goal of mine, but when I went to work for Billy Dean, um, he has really looked out for me over the years. And uh, we, there was an, a third person in our, our little circle there that I worked with some too, um, that we, we all kind of wrote together a little bit because they, they wanted to get me into that. And being a producer, I write as a producer. And I didn't realize I was doing that at first, but now mm-hmm. I, I do get it that I, I don't um, I don't get out and have a whole lot of experiences in my life to really get inspired by. And um, so if I'm writing, it's usually with an artist or somebody and helping them craft what they've started and make it something that's going to record well. Yeah. yeah. So and I, have, I have written some. I've got some I'm proud of, you know, but it's not anything that I wanted to try to make a living at. Um, but I, I say all that about Billy. He gave me a pub deal for a couple of years early on and, and kind of trained me in the the ways of what he learned. And he came through the 90s school in country, which that was some heavy hitting songwriting. Those guys, they didn't let one phrase go by that didn't matter. And, and that's what was frustrating was I learned that way. 
And then when I tried to branch out and go write with younger artists and people on the new scene, none of those rules apply anymore. You know, yeah. they don't worry about that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think that disillusionment may kind of turn me off and said, that's not really my thing. Yeah. Well, let me, let's, let's rewind just for a second, because selfishly, I want to ask you a question that I probably, well, I just want to get somebody else's perspective on when you say a development deal, Right. Tell me what what does that entail? Do you? I mean, in my mind, you find an artist and you you cut a record on them, and then, and the, I mean, I, and I know that there's a certain part of like finding your A and R guy. I mean, you're the you're the guy that's finding the material. You're you're making them sound good on it. Then then what do you do as a development deal? I honestly think that was part of the beginning of the shift of of what's happening around town because I think that some of these guys that were successful producers through the nineties or whatever um, saw an opportunity because labels labels used to sign an artist into a development deal. It was an experimental thing that there was no guarantee that you were going to have a full record come out. They just wanted to go in and cut a few sides on you, basically called dibs on you so that no other label could get you cut some things, let you find your style, see if it's working. If it's not, they have an easy exit strategy to where they're not stuck with you forever, but nobody else could scoop you up in the process. Mm -hmm. And then it would allow you to at least have a little chance to, to get through this and learn how to go in the studio and record and, and find your sound. Mm -hmm. Well, when they couldn't afford to do that anymore, uh, independent producers saw an opportunity that if I can afford to finance a little four or five song session, take you in, cut some sides in exchange for a piece of ownership, kind of like a manager would do or, or an agent to say, I, I don't know any of the percentages of what they were, but for a round number, let's just say 5%, you know, I'm going to take you, pair you up with some good writers. Cause I know people around town, um, you know, we'll cut these sides. I'll pay for everything up front. Then I know enough people at labels that maybe I can walk you in and get you a meeting with somebody where you couldn't on your own. You know, it was kind of acting like a manager, but more than that, it was also someone who's developing your talent, your sound, helping you create the art. To mm -hmm. be I don't know how much of that is still going on now, because again, it, it's mutated and shifted even more to where I think publishing companies are kind of doing some of that now. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, everything's kind of squishy right now. And I know we kind of touched on it a few minutes ago, but it, you know, every, um, every misfortune um, of like the music business changing as much as it has, has to come with some kind of superpower. Um, yeah. Also, you know, like, uh, it, you know, if, you know, 10 years ago, it would have been like, Hey, this YouTube thing is going to take off. If you, you know, YouTube is going to be the new, um, you're going to be able to believe it or not, have your own show and, yeah. and be able to go live in an instant. And, and people are going to play a lot of their music from there. And it's going to be the second biggest search engine in the world owned by the same company as the first. So what, what is that superpower now? Do you think, have you thought about that? I, I don't know. I, I, I think we're still on the on the back end of the first one. Honestly, I don't know that we've shifted to anything else yet. And I mean, we didn't see this one coming, so I, I don't really know how to guess what's coming along the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think back to our childhood, you go back 35, 40 years, the idea that anybody in their bedroom could create something that looks like a major TV studio and upload it in an instant to the world and not have to call anybody that works at a TV station, anybody that works at a network, anybody that works at, you know, I mean, they just opened the gates wide open for anybody mm -hmm. to do it. And, it. and from a business standpoint, that devalued the whole thing. You know, the value mm -hmm. of having your own television show now is not near what it was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. you know, that was huge. Um, any artist can reach directly to their fans now this way. Um, I don't know. I, it, it's caused people to have to figure out how do I do this better than somebody else? Mm -hmm. you know, Cause it's really hard yeah. to stand out from the pack in the, when everybody can do it. Yeah. So, so, uh, so Brent, <laughs> what do you have coming up? What are you, who are you working on right now? Uh, we just started a brand new record yesterday with Billy Dean. I mentioned him earlier. He's mm -hmm. coming back 
in to do a um, a trap rock record, which is going to be fun. Trap rock. Trap rock. It's basically everything in between Leonard Skinner and Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> It can rock. It can be smooth. Uh, it basically just has to get you in the mindset of of going to the beach and and what you would be doing while you're there. You know, well, I can't think of a more perfect guy to produce trop rock. I, I'm, that, that... I'm your guy, man. No, <laughs> I, am this, I am living proof that if you just don't quit, <laughs> the perfect project will eventually land in your lap. The music uh, business will come to you. <laughs> he brought in. He's got a, a buddy that. Uh, plays real steel drums and wanted to bring him to the studio yesterday. And so we went in, it's, it's kind of backwards pre-production of what I've done in the past, but he came in and just sang a work tape with him and his guitar real quick to a click. I built a little fast track with just a couple loops, some shaker stuff to kind of get it in that feel, played a quick, you know, bass and a piano track. And then uh, Bill went in there to do steel drums because he wanted to play to a little bit of a track to do that. You know, and I'm thinking steel drums is probably almost always the last thing to go on a track. If that's the afterthought, you know, everyone goes, what does this need? Well, let's put some steel drums on it, you know. And so the whole track's usually there. Those guys and don't ever have to play. No, steel drums. And yeah, not steel guitar. <laughs> um, so it was kind of a fun tag team, really creative day uh, the way we did it. But that came out cool. Uh, it's going to be a fun project. Um, I'm hoping I get to go to the record release concert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you do a record, when you do a record like that, yeah. do you pretty much keep it all in house? I mean, between you and the most part, and your brother Danny, y'all pretty much can cover everything in half the time. So yeah, do, we do you we both all in house the same way. We rarely work together. That's what's ironic um, because we kind of are redundant. We kind of do the same skill set. Right. So he does his thing. I do mine. Um, the stuff I don't play um, that would that would come up in the kind of music I do or steel guitar and fiddle. Um, and so I always hire out for those, maybe harmonica, if that were to come up, that kind steel of thing. Drum. I've got people that play all those and, um, and then background vocals to me, that's a lot of fun casting that the right way. Yeah. You know, and calling different singers. Granted, I do pretty much all my male background vocals myself. Um, unless they're just wanting something really, really odd that I can't do. Yeah. But going back to the the karaoke work earlier, that was a great training ground for having to learn how to sing different ways. Yeah. Because you got to go in and kind of emulate what the original guy did. So uh, yeah. I've sang a lot over the last year yeah. and a half. It was good training. And nothing like having to do it to, that That's right. makes, makes you better, faster, right? You have to. Yeah. yeah I, I remember when uh, I was a musical director at a church here in Murfreesboro. And I remember going, the only thing I'm not comfortable with right now is like B3 and keyboards. <laughs> and so I said, hey, put me put me on B3 yeah. <laughs> on a Sunday morning. And I'm like, I, I'll, I'll promise I'll know enough not to embarrass anybody. Yep. <laughs> and I did. And I got comfortable with it. But that, that's how you have to do it. Sometimes you have to say yes and say, yeah, I can mix it. I can mix that project. That's and been the story life man you just you say yes and then figure out how to do it later mm -hmm. um, yeah I, the last touring gig i had was with uh joe nichols country artist who i've got to produce some things for him too we did a little five or six song ep of traditional covers mm -hmm. that, songs that he loved and, and wanted to do and put out and um and we did all that right here at my place this way uh and they came out really good old um Don Weeb stuff and Merle Haggard and Keith Whitley and that kind of thing. On so, Spotify? It is on Spotify. Okay. I think it's called the Traditional Country Series, I think is what they called it. Yeah. Uh, so that's on there. Um, but man, I, you know, I took that gig. It was offered to me once as the keyboard gig, which is what I was doing at the time. But the gig I was on, I, it wasn't a good time to leave and everything. So I turned it down. And um, another probably a couple of years went by. And they called again and said, you play guitar too, right? Um, I had a, a buddy in the band who knew what all I did. And he said, well, you know, the the secondary guitar spot came available. It's all acoustic and like rhythm electric, you know. He kind of acted like it was more of an acoustic gig uh, than it was electric. And so I thought, well, I can do that. And uh, 
so I get all the material from the band leader. And I mean, it was as much electric as it was acoustic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I, as much as I had played here in my room with my stuff, I'd never gotten out and gigged in a band touring as an electric player. Mm-hmm. So I was very under geared, under prepared. It forced me to go out and, you know, buy the right gear to make this happen and build a pedal board and do all that stuff, not rely on plugins. Mm-hmm. You know, Cause I'd gotten to where I was using all the, I loved waves GTR uh, for that kind of stuff. And um, PRS had put out some digital amps that were great. That I, I liked a lot, and, but you can't take all that on the road with you, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I had to go out and get it and, and put it together. And, um, and I learned it, you know, I mean, I, I probably, if I go back to those first few shows or that first weekend I went out, I'd probably cringe to listen to them, you know, but I'm thankful for it. <laughs> Yeah, well, speaking of uh, um, speaking of virtual instruments, Mark Jacoby, I'll, I'll pop it up here in a second. Uh, he wants to know virtual instruments. Hang on just a second. Uh, virtual instruments have come a long way. Any thoughts? What are you using? Oh, my gosh. They've come a long way. Um, so I do. Um, I, I became a big fan of the subscription services that are out there. So um, I've got the East West Composer Cloud, whatever they call that. Um, I use their pianos a lot. Uh, probably 90% of the time, if it's a regular, just straight ahead piano, their C7 is great. Um, I did a Christmas record for Larry Stewart that came out last year that was really jazzy on some stuff. And uh, the Steinway of theirs got used quite a bit in that and really sounded nice. Um, I play real organ. Um, well, I shouldn't say real. It's the the Hammond um, DK um, or XK3 is what it is. And I run it through my real Leslie. Um, so it's getting mic'd up with tubes and all of that stuff. So that's cool. Um, I've got a bunch of contact stuff to the native instruments, uh, sounds that you just can't have enough sounds. It's tools, you know, and especially in this day and age, what I run into as a keyboard player is everybody wants something that sounds mutated or ganky or whatever, even if it's just a piano, it needs to sound like a piano from another world. And then you don't have to play as much, you know, they don't mm-hmm. want you to play near as busy as we used to, mm-hmm. but the sound has got to sound more crazy than ever. Yeah. You know? So there's some cool ones. I like noir a lot uh, yeah. that native instruments makes. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a piano collection. Okay. Uh, Una Corda is a, another one. That's, I think the same company put those out. Um and then I mean you synth stuff for days. Keyscape's great, you know. There's a, a ton of those. Uh, have you used? Uh, let's see. Gregory Price had a question. What kind of production tools do you use these days? And we covered that. Mm-hmm. Um, I I uh, used Arcade for a little while. I didn't really. I mean, it was at the t- at a time when I wasn't producing a lot of music. I was you know yeah. working at the church. But did you have you used that? I have not. Um, it doesn't really. I, I don't really get that kind of music that benefits mm-hmm. that much from it. You know, for me, I, I do a lot of country, a lot of um, worship music, a lot of uh, even bluegrass and older country stuff, you know? So for me, I tend to look for the more realistic samples, you know, and those are the kinds that I'm, I'm going to buy it and keep it. And it's just always going to work, you know, because once you find something that sounds like a great world, it's her, unless they just come out with something that's way <laughs> better sampled down the road. It sounds like the real world, sir. Then you yeah. Use it. Now I will say what I what I love that Output did um, was the effects engine from Arcade. They sold as uh, I think it's called Movement, um, and it's basically the effects that gets put on this stuff. Mm-hmm. I bought that, and it is great to throw on. You know, if you've got a regular pad sound that's just kind of boring, you pull this on there, and all of a sudden it adds that Arcade magic to what it is, or you can throw it on your drum kit for something weird and ganky. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of what I noticed out of arcade was the effects of it were great. And I'm glad mm-hmm. they, they broke that out and offered it as a separate piece. I didn't realize um, I'm only familiar with the arcade thing. And I know the effects engine is, is really cool. Probably mm-hmm. one of the things that drew me to it. I think but, so. Cause I mean, let's face it, the synth sounds, they're all pretty much the same, you know, I mean, it's, they're all going to try to recreate versions of the same thing, but make it sound a way that you haven't heard it yet. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, do you work with any bands? Uh, let's see. Uh, like, uh, or, or do the projects that you take on tend to be uh, like a singer and then what you can do? Uh, it seems it's like mostly solo artists. Yeah. That's typically who finds me because my production style is me playing all the stuff and that kind of thing. I have yeah. worked with a, a couple bands along yeah. the way and I'm open to it. It's fun. Um, I feel so unused <laughs> on those days because yeah. I'm so used to having to play everything to just sit there and, uh, and produce. I, I start getting antsy and want to jump in there and do something. Yeah. You know? So um, it's fun. Yeah. And, you know, that takes a whole different kind of patience. Um, yeah. Cause you're usually dealing with people that don't have a lot of studio experience. You know, even the, the stuff that we do every day, like playing with the click track and stuff like that doesn't come easily. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of time spent um, just getting them into that, that place and that position. And I, I'm a fast mover. I like working fast and getting things done in a hurry, mm-hmm. moving on to the next project. And so yeah. that's a little counterproductive sometimes. And that's probably why my phone doesn't ring for that quite as much. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, let's see. How do you uh, keep all your samples and sounds organized? I'd love to know this too. Cause- Great question, because I think that's that's huge. Um, I've got one drive that's all samples. Um, and I know that it's all on there in the right place. And I mean, I, I work with it enough at this point that it's organized for me, you know, mm-hmm. usually by, uh, by company. Cause I've got several that I, I buy from all the time. Uh, I've got all the contact stuff in there, got all my East West stuff and I, I'll have folders for each company. And then within there, you can see the different collections and stuff like that. And it's pretty easy to find and get mm-hmm. around. Um, I also love um, the company that sound. I want that sound to use any of their stuff. Yeah. Those are great. Uh, that's that's almost always a starting point on a session for me. Because um, when I'm building a track, I like to start with the drums. You know, I want to get that in place and then everything else play to that. But it helps me play more musically if there's something going on in there other than just a click track. So I'll use their sounds a lot because they're good human performances of this stuff, of shakers and tambourines and whatever. Yeah. And I'll build out that side of it and then play to that. And it usually keeps me, you know, within the grid pretty good. Uh, What are your, what are your top two go-tos on the, that sound stuff? Is it. They did uh, the organic percussion collection was all Eric Darkin. um, And it's great. I mean, that's, that's my shakers and tambourines um, for stuff. The, um, the Aaron uh, Sterling stuff, I think it was called Sterloid. Was Sterloid, great, yeah. Yeah, that's a great collection. Um, it kind of depends on what kind of music we're doing, too, you know, because the, the organic one was great. The cinematic pop one was great. Um, even the future drums. Like, I don't do a lot of hip hop stuff or anything like that, but modern country production has a lot of that stuff in it. Yeah, you know? it does. And so to bring my backstory of nineties country mixed with what those things are doing. It, it gets it to the right place in a hurry. You know? Yeah. Um, let's see, Mark, uh, I've heard this before. Have you used the East West background singers? Love that plugin. Really? So I, I'm kind of using that as a secret weapon right now because <laughs> oh. I, I'm not afraid to sing like a girl, you yeah. know, like I've, I've made fake choirs on tracks and stuff before, but if it's all me, it's all me, you know, right. and it's hard to get away from that. But that plug in right there, you can ease a bed of oohs or ahs in behind what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden it sounds like a bigger deal. Mm-hmm. I, it's got a word builder in it. And I've tried to use that because if you watch their videos and stuff, it's pretty convincing how you can say phrases and stuff. And if you've got one or two singers and that's blended in behind it, it's very convincing. Really? I yeah. haven't make that work. I, I don't know if it's something I'm doing wrong or if it's just that once you get it in your hands, it's, you know, who knows? Yeah. But they've got a, uh, a key switch uh, patch on there that just patches through different vowels that they sing. Yeah. Um, and man, just to, to throw a bed of, of their ooze under your chorus, all of a sudden, I mean, it would cost me three or 400 bucks to get singers per song, you know, in to do that. Yeah. And, and that plugin barely costs that much. So yeah. it's a game changer. Cool. I love it. Yeah. 
I did some stuff with Mark and he was using, using that and it sounded pretty convincing. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, one other thing, do you ever use any drum triggering stuff? I was going to ask you about, uh, if you use slate or anything like that. Um, yeah, I use trigger. I use trigger for, uh, for sample replacement and stuff like that. Now, nine times out of 10, I'm playing real drums on the track. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm set up with that here at the house. It's quicker for me to play it than it is to program it. Yeah. Um, because when I program, I want to program like a real drummer. And so the time it takes to add some of that little, you know, human yeah. to it, whatever. Yeah. I, I could have just played. <clears throat> and so yeah. um, every now and then, like, like I say, with some of these newer tracks, the, the pop side of it and even some of the new worship stuff and all that. It actually makes more sense to program it because mm -hmm. it's so, so on the grid, you know, even if it's real sounds, but a lot of times I don't even really use a, um, a drum programming software like that. I'll just drag and drop samples or whatever, or play it through contact, you know, drag it in and just play a kick drum, play a snare drum where I want it. I might go back and do a live cymbals pass over that. Mm -hmm. I hate sample symbols. They never yeah. sound real. <laughs> no yeah. matter what. I don't know why. And that little live element makes all the difference. Like, uh, yeah. like I've noticed that you can program a whole track and then once you put one real instrument in there, whether it be bass, acoustic That's or right. whatever, it just makes everything else believable. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I will program some depending on the kind of track it is. Yeah. And a lot of these sample things like the, that sound guys, they are great at, having collections of real instruments that are loops. You know, you can find a hi-hat loop in there that, you know, maybe four bars long and it's repetitive, but it still feels like a human playing it, mm -hmm. you know, rather than right. the same thing. So. so really quickly, walk me through, like, uh, if I sent you a song, yep. and I know each song probably is treated separately, but if I sent you a song, tell me what order you do things in and how long it would take you to do that. Yep. So, so top to bottom process is, you know, I'm going to ask that you send a work tape and usually, you know, two or three examples of where you want this to go, you know, and why, because that helps too, you know? Um, so sometimes somebody will send me something that says, man, I just really like the way the drums sound in this. I go, great. That helps me know mm -hmm. I'm already thinking that way, or I just love the groove or this. I, I played my work tape a little fast. This is kind of the tempo I want it, mm -hmm. you know? And so with two or three examples like that, I can formulate the bubble that we're going to live in for this song. Right. So then I chart it, um, a natural number chart. I'm sure you guys are, have heard about that and familiar with that whole deal. Mm -hmm. So uh, write that out. Once you've got that in place, now you can start building and uh, I'll set up the whole session in pro tools. I've got a, a great template. that has got everything set up for what I'm going to use all the time. Um, and it's not that I use the exact same things on every song. I've set this up to where it's got everything I might use. And then I delete mm -hmm. the stuff that I don't. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and so I will at that point, you know, get a uh, click set. I'll throw some locates on there, some markers that match my chart. So I know where the sections are mm -hmm. um, or visually that way. And then I'll build out the percussion side of it. Like I say, I'll throw a, a shaker up. I'll go ahead and throw tambourine in the courses if it's that kind of thing. Uh, if it's got any loop stuff, I'll program that ahead of time and get that in place um, so that there's something musical to play to. And then I just go down the list and I'll play drums first, then bass. Um, next will depend on the kind of song it is. I might go ahead and start working on synth stuff and keys and build that to play guitars on top of it because I know that'll affect how I play the guitars. Mm hmm or the other way around. It might be more of an acoustic driven song, more of an organic singer songwriter thing. So I dive right into guitar stuff, get that, and then go back and add whatever keyboard stuff it needs just to fill out a little mm -hmm. bit. Cause that's, that's where the order of operations really does get important. You know, if you fill up too much of the track with one thing, you're not going to play the right stuff with the other parts later on, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So I kind of direct myself that way. At yeah. that point, I mean, the track's pretty much there. Um, and all that'll probably take, uh, if, I'm, if I'm really digging in and spending the right amount of time on about three or four hours to get all that done. You know, so usually before lunch, I can have it for one song in place. Now, if somebody sends me a batch of songs and says, hey, I got five songs I need you to do, mm -hmm. 
then I, I break that out and I'll spend a day just doing programming drums and bass. And that's it. And that usually takes the whole day. And then the next day I'll get all the keyboards and guitars done and kind of spread it out that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending on whether somebody's going to come in to sing or whether I'm sending files to them and they're just going to put their vocal on it and send it back. We do both at this point. We just set up a session and, and do that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you play with a tempo map and, or start with your own drums and fix a click to that tempo map? I think you play, play with a click. Play click. Yeah. Now, I, I, interesting you, you bring that up because when I did the karaoke tracks, um, they were insistent that it follow to the letter, the original record. Mm -hmm. so I had to build tempo maps for those um, that would follow it and then play with that. So I've done both. Um, and I'm glad we have that technology that we can, but with today's modern music, uh, it's so on the grid. Um, I think you're better off to play with the click. And in most cases I'm tight enough that it's going to be fine and I don't have to do any extra stuff. But if it's, if it's on a master level and something that I'm putting out, you know, at that level, mm -hmm. uh, I'll even go in and quantize drums and make sure that it's like right on the grid, you know, not to the point of feeling unhuman, but that's just the standard that people expect, you know, yeah. and all your loops and stuff. You'll be glad you did in the end because all of your programming and loops and stuff line up a lot better. You don't have any little flammy, you know, phasey issues and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I know we're getting, we're getting pretty close to the top of the hour here, but, um, before I left California, um, I think I noticed on your Instagram, which I've put it up there a couple of times, yeah. uh, go follow, go follow Brent. Uh, he's doing some really cool stuff, but you mentioned that you were playing at, I think it's the ACM awards. Um, I did CMAs last couple C of years. Yeah. CMAs. And you played yeah. for Charlie pride, right? Yeah. He was, was in last performance. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. uh, so did you get to hang out with him any or? Not really. This year, CMA was very different. I've done that the last two years. Um, and in 2019, it was a party. I mean, and it usually is from what I've heard. Um, everybody's excited to be there. You're seeing people that you don't see throughout the whole year. Mm -hmm. um, this year with COVID being what it was, uh, everybody was pretty sequestered and, and uh, you stay in your spot and we'll escort you when, <laughs> when you need to be there. Otherwise, yeah. just keep your mask on and your head down and yeah. you'll be so that's kind of how it was. So yeah. we did get to be around him a little bit. He was, man, he, even at his age, he was still really with it and cracking right. jokes and uh, he sang great. Uh, it was cool to be a part of that. Yeah. Uh, we never really know when we get the house band call, you know, how much will be used, what they need. You know, it never, you don't know until usually the week of the mm -hmm. show, you start going in and doing pre-tape stuff. If you do any of that. Um, and this year they, um, we also had to be on call as kind of the, the alternates because with the COVID testing, the way it was, if somebody tested positive the night before the show, they didn't get to do the show. So there were a couple instances where we got a call the night before saying, why don't you look at this song? Cause you may have to get up there and play it tomorrow, you yeah. know, sub in Not and sing it. Right. But I mean, who knows, you know, <laughs> you never know. Uh, from the old church days, I didn't come prepared to sing. No, exactly. Don't, just, don't listen to the singer. Just listen to the message. <laughs> don't listen to the words. Just listen to the way we sing. Yeah. No, that was that was really cool. So you were the house man. You, uh, right. yeah, that's that's cool. I, I was thinking for some reason that um, that you were um, playing for Charlie that night, but you played with several people that night. Then I guess there yeah, right? was Charlie and Jimmy Allen was all we did that night. The the year before we did. Uh, there was a big medley that happened with Dolly Parton, uh, Zach Williams, King and Country, uh, that whole thing that happened. And we played for that. And then we also did this big opening montage. Uh, it was Year of the Woman that year. And so it was all the, you know, big female artists of country for a while. And it was just this montage medley where our band and the other side of the stage was Carrie Underwood's band. And we were like tag teaming back and forth. It was pretty cool. And that actually... Everything was played live on that too, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, that was not taped ahead of time. So, so was the broadcast we heard? Was it a live mix then, or did they do post on it? Uh, no, it ran live. Um, it was a combination of uh, they were pre-taping some things this year, just really as a logistics thing to keep, uh, control how many people were on site at one mm -hmm. time. 
you know, mm-hmm. so there were a few things like that that got taped ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, but even that, I don't think they really do any post to it. I think it's just they they tape it live, and that's what's going to air. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, there's there's something something really cool about that. Still, you know, Huge. Uh, about yeah. non non perfection, just like real. Like I, I don't know. I was just that this morning. I was watching TV. Even even reality shows yeah. aren't aren't they aren't real anymore. You know, it's like I was watching this stupid show. Kevin McManus might like this. It was called. Uh, <laughs> Um, they it's a plane, uh, plane repo is what it is, and basically, oh. have you seen it? <laughs> I've seen commercials, yeah, <laughs> and it's so staged, man. It's like, yeah, we have uh, done a couple of those kind of shows before. Um, hey, um <clears throat> by the way, there's a there's a cool book you might want to read. I just finished it up. It's uh, um, oh, what is his name? It's called Green Lights, um, Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. All right, I, I have it in my list. I've downloaded it, and I, I need to read, read it. it. Read it. It's okay. a good. It's a good read. I mean, there's a there's some language in it, and but man, that dude's lived a a lived a pretty enviable right. life. Which all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> uh, and he tells that story about that's the first line he ever said as an actor. Wow. Uh, and that, and that's kind of what he's known for. But yeah, he got the full mileage out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he has. Yeah, he has. Anyway, check that book out. It, it's pretty cool. Cool. Um, cool. Well, man, it's been it's been so cool to catch up with you. We Me need too. to grab grab some lunch here pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, now that in Nashville, I think uh, I think the uh, the mask mandate is done, right? I think we're able to. Full I guess so. restaurants. So I, it's Mount Julie. It's been a little different than downtown Nashville. It's been a little more. I think ours ran out first, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, yeah. well, I, seems to be turning a corner. Irregardless, let's go grab some lunch one day or coffee or something. I'm Talk down. Books and stuff. Well, uh, thanks, Brent. Uh, Thank you, Kev. I'll, uh, I'll be talking to you soon. Okay. All right, buddy. All right, see you, bud. All right, so I uh, that was fun. I, I learned a lot. I'm going to go check out uh, Mark Jacoby. You were telling me about the East West background singers and I heard them and everything, but I have to go check them out. There's a lot of cool stuff on here. Um, so uh, anyway. Okay. So, Hey, thank you guys for, for coming today. And uh, the, I, I see your thank yous in the, in the comments. It, this is fun. I love, uh, I love talking to smart people like Brent. Hey, um, one more thing before you go. Uh, don't forget that I have just created this cool thing and I want you to check out. This is a, uh, a multi-part training video that I think you're really going to like. I, I'm going to dispel some myths about mixing. And uh, like I said before, uh, I thought long and hard about um, the second one. Um, it's a, it's kind of a, it's a touchy subject for mixing engineers. So go check it out when you get a chance, just go to mixcoach.com forward slash myths. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, you'll be encouraged and, uh, and you'll like it. Okay, guys, it has been fun. I will see you guys again really soon. All right. Let me find my, let me find my last screen here. I'll see you guys soon. Okay. Bye.